But that's an excellent question. Yes. In Job 38. In who? Job 38. Job chapter 38. What verse? Uh, well, I'm just curious if, if all the questions in here are uh, in to anyone in particular. There's a, uh, several different questions. I'm just wondering if, if they're directed towards anyone in particular, any people groups. I told you before. When I preached to you out of Job chapter 25, when I preached at uh, Job chapter 26, and I preached it a number of times, I preached about the six questions that most probably God is going to ask us in the judgment seat of Christ. We've talked about it a lot of times. When I start that message, I, <clears throat> I begin by saying that years and years and years ago, I stumbled upon one of the greatest truths that I ever found uh, anywhere. And that was not the statements in the Bible, but the questions in the Bible. And I, uh, I come across the first two questions that are found in the Word of God. It set up for me a lifelong study of not just looking at the Bible in a blasé reading it sense, but looking at the punctuation of it and, and looking at the questions. The first question found in the Bible is found in Genesis chapter 3. And the first question in the Bible wasn't asked by God. The first question in the Bible was asked by the devil. And in Genesis chapter 3 verse 1, the devil asked Eve in a question Yea, hath God said. Now, that's not as, we, we say that all the time, and we say it like, it was like it was a statement. Yea, hath God said. That's not the way it went. It was, yea, hath God said? That's the first question in the Bible. The first question in the Bible was the question the devil asked a woman who's a type of the church. And the question was, did God really know what he was talking about when he told you what he told you? You know what the second question is? Second question is found over there when, when uh, after they fall in Genesis chapter 3. And God is coming down in the cool of the day. To, I guess he was meeting with Adam and Eve and he was having Bible studies with them or whatever. And uh, suddenly he showed up at the Bible study place and they weren't there. So he goes to look for them. And the second question the Bible also found in Genesis chapter 3 is by God. And the question there was, Adam... Where art thou? You see, the first two questions in the Bible, it really got me going. Because the first two questions in the Bible uh, were the two questions of life. You know what you got to answer for yourself tonight? Every one of you. Number one, did God really mean what he said when he said it? And the second question is, where are you tonight? Now, we like to pretend that God is walking through the garden and Adam, come out, come out, wherever you are. Adam, where are you? Oh, Adam, I was over there. Where we're going to have Bible study and you weren't there. Oh, Adam, that Adam, I, I, I'm looking for you. God knew exactly where he was. If God would have done it, through, if I'd have been God back then, I'd have come down with a Remington 12 shotgun and I'd have had four or five angels as hunting dogs and I'd have flushed Adam out of there and boom, got him as he ran out of the bushes. He knew exactly where he was. He knew what bush he was hiding under. He knew what fig tree he got the figs off. He knew exactly where God was. You say, then why did God ask the question, Adam, where are you? Because Adam had just got into a fallen state after he disobeyed what God said. And God knew exactly where Adam was. God wanted to see if Adam knew where he was. First two questions in the Bible. Did God really mean what he said? And the second question is, where are you tonight? Where are you tonight? You know, those are the two things that if you're saved or you're lost, those are the two things that God will haunt you with and ask you every day of your life. When you're faced with a decision, like we talked about Sunday, going into the wrong house, when you're faced with that decision, you know what the Holy Spirit of God's going to say? 
Did God really know what he was talking about when he said not to go into this house? When you do something and you know it's wrong and yet you, the Holy Spirit of God, all, every day of our lives, all day long, he's going to say, did God really know what he was talking about? Most of God's people, honestly, we live our lives like we don't really believe God knew what he was talking about. And then the second question, all day long, and your walk with God, you know what he's going to ask you? Where are you? You sit down there and get up in the morning and late for work and don't have time for your Bible and don't have time to even say good morning to the Lord. You're down there eating your crummy little breakfast, you know, and stuff in your face and the Lord's standing there saying, where are you? You know what? If I just blinked, you'd choke on that grapefruit you're eating there. If I just snapped my fingers, you'd put those cornflakes up your nose instead of in your mouth and you'd die on the spot. All I have to do is just Wink my eye, and that I can turn that I can turn that orange juice into cyanide if that's what I wanted to do. Where are you? How did you get up this morning? Just walk right by me. I mean, I when you get out of bed, I was there. I, you went in to brush your teeth. I was, and you just walked right out. You sat down at the table to eat your breakfast. I sat down across of you. Thought for sure you're going to look up and say, thank you, Lord, for this breakfast of mine. You didn't. You just dug right in. You got a work meal over your face. Where are you this morning? You drive to work. Somebody pulls out in front of you. Gord says, where are you today? <laughs> we don't wave that way up in heaven. <laughs> <laughs> all day long those two first when I found those first two questions I was off to the races because I knew now the questions were important in the Bible then I bumped into Job chapter 26 there and found those six questions that they asked and those six questions, there's only one person that can answer those six questions, and that's a, that's a born-again Christian. So I, I saw that pretty quick, that that just be a wild chance that that could be the six questions that when I stand at the judgment seat of Christ, God's going to ask me. Now, I've had guys say, well, I think you're way out of line with that, and I don't think that's true, to which I put my arms around them and hug them and say, I hope you're right, because I don't want to answer them. But don't ever think for a moment that when God doesn't ask the question, he won't demand an answer. He tells you that here. So then I start filing a set of questions for everybody. Every occupation out there, I found a question, a set of questions. I believe with the great white throne judgment of the judgment seat of Christ, I mean, you know, you know what man's preoccupation with is in life and everything we do? And your, your vocation may be 100% admirable. It may be 100% legit. You may be a plumber and you're the best plumber in the world. You may be an electrician and be the le best electrician in the world. You may be a car salesman and be the best car salesman in the world. You may be a lawyer and best lawyer in the world. You may be a doctor and be the best doctor in the world. But you know what we do with everything that we have that is our vocation? We make it so busy in our lives that we just don't have time for the Lord in our lives. And it doesn't have to be a bad thing. And I believe that for everybody out there in every vocation, God's going to have a set of questions, either at the great white throne judgment or the judgment seat of Christ. How come you were so busy with this that you didn't get this done? And those six questions he's going to ask us, if they're going to show up there, which my own personal opinion is, I don't know where else they could show up. There are some tough questions, man. Now, when I got here in Job, this goes to your question about natural selection. When I got into Job chapter 38, I found a set of questions that he's going to ask an evolutionist, a scientist, a science geologist. I mean, there's a whole realm of scientists that are going to fit into this set of questions. This should be something to see. And, uh, you know, I, I, I look at verse 3. Gird up now thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee an answer thou me. He's demanding an answer from somebody. Now, do you think God just puts that in there for, like, parsley on your steak? 
give it a little color? If God is going to ask some questions, he's going to demand some answers. We live in a Christianity today that we think God is this big marshmallow in the sky that just kind of sits up there and just kind of watches everything go by and allows you and me to just to use him and abuse him. And we do. We don't give any reverence to God of who he is. We don't give any reverence to God of what he is. We think God is this great marshmallow in the sky that we can just use and abuse for what we want to do the way we want to do it, any way we want to do it, any time we want to do it. And we have lost the concept today in Christianity that God demands some things from us. I mean, you can live, after he died on the cross for you and for me, and he suffered the way that he did for you and me, I'll give it to you. You can take your own life, absolutely, and do whatever you want to do, the way you want to do it, and probably, in a lot of cases, go through the whole life and get to the end of it. But I want to tell you something. After the sacrifice that he made for you, after what he did for you, if you think, saved or lost, you're going to come up to the great white throne judgment or the judgment seat of Christ, and he ain't going to demand some answers for you based on what he did, you're a fool. Now, you know why he gave us the Bible? The Bible is the great cheat sheet on the judgment seat of Christ. It's like having to take a test and somebody giving you the answer to the test before you have to take it. You see, God doesn't want you to stand there and not have the answer to the questions he's going to ask. So he gives them to you already. The fact is, we don't, we, don't, we don't get into the Bible. We don't see them, so we don't really care about them. And I'm telling you right now, when you get into Job chapter 38, there's only one set of people that can answer these questions. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind. Now, I, I got to stop here and tell you that if you go over to Ezekiel chapter 1, Ezekiel chapter 10, and many other places, and I've given it to you many, many times, the whirlwind, wherever you find it in the Bible. I don't care where. The context will automatically be the second coming of Christ or the judgment of God coming down on man. Now we know that the book of Job, as we find it, is a picture of the tribulation period. We know that. Job is the land of us. That's right where the Jews are going to be in the tribulation period. The name of Job means one persecuted. Job is persecuted by the devil for seven days and seven nights. Israel is persecuted by the devil for seven years uh, of the tribulation period. Uh, the, God turns the captivity of Job back there uh, in, uh, uh, in the, uh, about Job chapter 38, just like God turned the captivity of Israel uh, toward the end of the tribulation period. There's a resurrection in the end of the book of Job, just like there is at the end. And there's 42 chapters in the book of Job, 42 months in the great tribulation period. That's what it's a picture of. But from a practical standpoint, this whirlwind is God's judgment on the world. Now, when a man saved or lost is going to either stand at the great white throne judgment if he's unsaved, or he's going to stand at the judgment seat of Christ if he is saved, God's going to demand some answers from him. And we're going to be looking for some answers. How foolish it is that all of your life you had the book that held the answers that every question he was going to ask, but because you were so busy in what you were doing and preoccupying yourself with all the things that you thought were so important that you never bothered to get the answer. That's man. So you're going to have these little evolutionists pop up here. You're going to have these little scientists show up here. You know, NASA is a great organization. I'm always intrigued by outer space and sending men into space. I, uh, I, I, I personally wouldn't go myself. I mean, right now, uh, they're, they're already shining up. Got hundreds of people. They're paying in advance for the first trip to Mars. Um, you know, that trip will be canceled, by the way. I just want you to know that. Man will never get to Mars. Man got to the moon. That's as far as he's going to go. I mean, I, I think NASA is, a, is, a, is an incredible thing to study. I think it's, they've done great things. I think they have. But it's all for one reason. Of course, you know that. And sometimes all the great achievements they have. I mean, we're in a space race with Russia in the 50s. They put up Sputnik, 
uh, we put up, they put up a man, we put up a monkey. I mean, we, you know, at that thing. And then finally we got a man up in space. They had rockets going up. We had rockets going up. You know, at the end of World War II, when we defeated Nazi Germany, and the Nazi Germany was the, was the worst regime in the, probably the last 200 years of man. Terrible situation. Hitler wanted to conquer the world. He had got all these scientists out of all the occupied countries, and uh, he had put them in a place where they were working on a nuclear bomb. They were working on uh, all kinds of things. Uh, they're the first one to develop rockets. They're over there in Germany someplace on the coast of the occupied countries, and they're flying on rockets. Of France, over the English Channel and, and, and called buzz bombs, and they were falling into Europe. They come up with one uh, that was the uh, uh, a bigger one than that, that was was so much bigger, and they launched it straight up. The you, the the V ones used to go off a ramp toward this one was straight up, had a gyro in it, and went over England and then dropped right into England. They were making a New York bomb. So at the end of World War II, you know what? It wasn't about we beat the Nazis. It wasn't about liberating everybody. You know what it was about? They knew that the next step was going to be outer space, so the Russians and the Americans came in to grab all those scientists and get them back. Russia got a bunch of them, probably got the best bunch of them, because Russia took almost everything. We got a bunch. Von Braun, that's, he's the father of modern rocketry. Von Braun. Von Braun? Von Braun. That's not Jewish. <laughs> hey, Von Braun. That's not Jewish. He was a German. We got him. He, he's the one that got our rocket program going. They got him. And of course, uh, the race was on. And of course, we wanted to get into outer space. We did. We wanted to get to the moon. We beat him to the moon. Uh, we wanted to get him, uh, do all the things that we do. Now we got guys living up there in the laboratory. Laboratory, not laboratory. <laughs> laboratory. <laughs> Why? Why do they at NASA planning all these things? Why at NASA do they do they go on a drawing board? Why out there in the desert do they have people who have been secluded in seclusion now for a year, two years, pretending they're on Mars, getting ready to someday to deal with the loneliness of being on Mars? Why is that? Science advancement? They want to get to the point where they, they colonize and, and no, you know what the whole reason of the space program is? To prove God and the Bible wrong, that's all. Hundred billion, billion, trillion dollars a year for one purpose. The Bible isn't true, God isn't true, and man did evolve, and we're going to prove it by going out and out of space. Now God told man back in Genesis that when God gave Adam dominion over things, he gave a dominion over the fish in the sea, the fowl of the air, and the things that creep on the ground. Man's dominion ends with the birds of, of the air. There's no dominion for man in outer space. And of course, if you know anything about Isaiah chapter 27 and other places in the Bible, you know that that's somebody else's domain. Man's not to be there. But man just can't stop being there because he wants to prove God wrong. They're going to show up. They'll be standing there. And when they come down through there, he's going to ask some questions. And he's going to say, uh, I mean, they're going, to, they're, going to, they're going to know they're in trouble. And he's going to say to them, who is this? Who is who is this that darkened the council by word without knowledge? That's the first words out of his mouth. You're gonna, they're going to walk up there. They're going to walk up there, stand before God, before the assembled universe, and he's going to look down and he's going to say, "Who is this?" Word without knowledge. You know what word without knowledge is? Science, evolution. It's words with no knowledge to it, but none of it's true. It's made up fairy tales. The Babylonians believed in it, the Egyptians believed in it, and when, uh, when Darwin repackaged it and put it out in the 1800s for the idiots to believe in in his day, it was an old thing, because Ecclesiastes said there's nothing new under the sun. And it's been out there forever. Man sees it, he puts a little sprinklies on it, like you do your donuts, and puts a little icing on it, and he says, wow, we got something new, origin of the species. And when he stand there before God, he's going to say, Oh, whoa, oh, oh, whoa, who is this that darkeneth counsel by word without knowledge? Yeah, all your life, 
you darkened the counsel of the Holy Spirit of God in people's lives by word without knowledge. Okay, big doctor boy. Get up thy loins now like a man. Don't you ever see it? You have a man's going to get up and do something? Oh, I'll show you. <laughs> So he said, gird up your loin. I demand of thee an answer. And here they come. Answer thou me. Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare, if thou hast understanding. Don't you know the great white throne judgment is going to be a hot seat, boy? Ooh. I'm telling you, most people, we have a wrong concept of it. We think that, you know, you just kind of go up there like like down Ford's assembly line. Little the truck's going down, and you just... No, no. That, that great white throne judgment could last for a million years. We ain't in any hurry. Every man, every woman that ever rejected God, anybody who ever thought they were smarter than God, that rejected what God said and what God did, is going to have a chance to defend himself and God, based on your profession, based on what you invested your life in, is going to ask you the questions. And you're going to have to come up with some answers. Now, when there is no answer, you know what the answer is going to be? Finally, you're going to have to come to the right answer before you're dumped into the lake of fire. You know what the right answer is? Jesus Christ. Everybody thinks when <coughs> you get to the Great white throne judgment, you know, God's going to take all your good works and all your bad works. Big old scale up there. Put all your good works on this side, all your bad works on this side. If your bad works outweigh your good ones, you go to hell. If your good works outweigh your bad ones, you go to heaven. That ain't what it's going to be. He's going to put you in his hand and Jesus Christ in his hand, and he's going to weigh out. You're going to come up short. All the things that you believed, all the men who taught you, all the people who invested their life in you for one purpose because they have their own axe to grind against God and they taught you what they taught you to destroy your faith in God and the Word of God. They're in line behind you, but now it's your turn. All of your life you taught in college. All of your life you worked for NASA. All of your life you worked here. You did this. You, you did great strides for mankind. Now God's going to ask you, where were you? You got understanding? Where were you when I leave? You talk about evolution. You talk about all these eons of time and all this stuff. Let me ask you a question. What's your authority for saying that? Where were you when I laid the foundation? That's a tough question. You see a rocket scientist and evolution to try to answer that? I mean, and, and by the way, guys, put it in context. It isn't going to be some pit of little tin horn preacher like me. You're going to be standing for the God of the universe whose eyes are in flaming fire, who looks like a hundred million cobalt bombs going off, and he's looking right down in the depth of your soul. Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare, if thou hast understanding. Where were you? Well, all your life you talked with such great authority. You made fun of me. You made fun of the Bible. You made fun of all my people. Okay, big boy, it's your turn. Spotlight on. Where were you? Right. <laughs> who laid the who laid the measures thereof? You, you talk about all these measurements from the galaxies and the planets and all of these things. Who laid those measurements? I want to see them. You got a big yardstick. I want to see it. How did you measure all those things? I got the measurements. For anybody in my Bible that believe me, those measurements of the universe were found back there in, 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 in Exodus. They were found over there in Hebrews. There are a number of places in the Bible if you want to find it. You're telling all these people all your life, well, this is this distance, and this is this, and this is how we do this, and this is what we need to do. Where were you? Come on. You're so smart, Mr. Ph.D., Mr. Doctor. All your life you made fun of the Bible. You made fun of the people that believe the Bible. Okay, it's your turn. 
You're smart. You're smarter than me. You know more about it than I do. You're on. Where were you? That's a day that every unsaved man and woman's going to come up against a holy God, brother, that you rejected right now in your life. And he tells you up there, I will demand of thee an answer. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Who hath stretched the line upon it? Now he's talking about the structure of the universe right there. He told you right there that the universe has measurements to it, and there's a line stretched out on it. Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? There was a scientist on this planet who would understand where the, what the cornerstone of the universe is. I know what it is. And I had a tough time getting out of the seventh grade. I know what the cornerstone of the universe is. And I don't know anything about sending a rocket to the moon. I know where the cornerstone is. And you know what? I didn't get it by going to NASA. I didn't get it by going to the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. I didn't get it by, I didn't get it by going through all of the great uh, educational things. I got it from a Bible that you could buy for 25 cents at a general dollar store. I know what the foundation is. I could take you through it, the Bible, and show it to you. Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? For who hath laid the cornerstone thereof? Oh, here it comes. When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. You know what that is? That's creation morning. Now my Bible says over there in Proverbs chapter 2. Just turn over there for a minute. I'm sorry, uh, Psalm chapter 2. <laughs> Look at 2 1. Starts out at the second coming of Christ, runs right into the great white throne judgment. Watch this. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, that's Christ, saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast their cords from us. Here's verse 4. Here it is. Here's the great white throne judgment. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. You see, we are such a marshmallow Christianity. We think that if the great white throne judgment... God is going to be standing there saying, oh, I got to send you to hell. <laughs> I don't know how I'm going to do this. I, I, I just, I, I, I just got to, give me a minute, I got to get some, I got to muster some courage to send you to hell. I got to, I just got, oh, that's, I just, that's a terrible thing going to hell. Oh, feel the heat down there. Oh, I know you don't want to go. I don't want you to go. I don't know how I'm going to do this because, oh, for God so loved the world. God is love and love is God. And how do I, how do, how does a loving God send somebody to hell? And, oh, I'm just having a struggle with this. Oh, what do I do? What do I do? What do, that ain't how it's going to be. <laughs> he gave his son on the cross and put him through hell for the sixth and the ninth hour for you. You thumbed your nose at him and did your own thing and then cultivated your career, cultivated everything in your life to get around the truth of that book. And now you stand there. He's demanding some answers for you. You get your shot at it, boy. You get your shot to stand up all your life. You told everybody that you was around, that you were smarter than God in that book. Okay! I get that. Now you get to prove it. You and him. No longer playing the big guy around the young college students that, that worship you. 
no longer at the, at the great seminars because you're a, a great eminent mind on, on all of these things and you get up and uh, no, no more like Sigmund Freud when he addressed all the great minds and he got up on that morning in the 1800s and announced to the world that God was dead. And everybody applauded. And you know what they did in heaven? They laughed. You know what the Christians around that time did? They laughed. The Christians said, God isn't dead. I just talked to him. Everything's fine. <laughs> Somebody else said, God died. I'm in the family. I didn't get a notice for the funeral. <laughs> what do you think a guy like that's going to do when he stands there? And there's a set of questions for the philosophers, brother. And that's in Proverbs. And what do you think, what do you think, what do you think that that man standing there, like Sigmund Freud, that announced to the world that God was dead? What he's going to do in the day when he has to look up and find out he is dead. He is. Get it straight. If you're on the camera, get it straight. We'll get a lot of thumbs down on this one. Get it straight. Amen. You laugh and make God, make fun of God all you want. You ridicule him, you ridicule his word, his people, and him, and make fun of him, and do all your life and your career. Make a joke out of the word of God and God. Remember this old saying, he who laughs, laughs, laughs best. The Bible says that he that sitteth in the heaven shall laugh. I mean, God said, hey, look, I demand of you an answer. And the guy starts to say, well, I, I, I studied all the charts, and I studied... I studied etymology and I studied this and I looked at all the different things and, and it just was clear, clear to me that uh, that you didn't exist and, and about that time all the hosts of heaven will roar into laughter. <laughs> you know, it's one thing when you're stupid and you're wrong and you stand there and try to say something stupid. What even rubs it in more is when people laugh at you. That's one of my secrets and and and, and penetrating the cults I deal with, I'll get them to a point where they'll say something and I'll just bust out laughing. It gets them so mad they get off their game and they can't breathe it right. Then you got them. I just laugh at them. And when a man stands there before God, you better get it straight. The Bible says, He that sitteth in the heaven shall laugh, he will have them in derision. You know what derision is? Well, it isn't good. The Lord's going to laugh. A little guy's going to get up there, whatever his vocation was, when he has to answer these questions, and Job chapter 38 is right down to the scientist, boy, and they're going to have to come up with an answer why they did all the things that they did, why they taught all the things that they taught. And the Bible says that the whole universe, when they start to explain to them, bust out of roaring laughter. And you know what? At some point in the conversation, when it's over, God's going to take away, I mean, I don't know if you know it or not, the Bible says in Revelation chapter 20, and I saw a great white throne, and a new face, and heaven and earth fled away, and there was found no place for them. I saw the dead small face stand before God, and the book were open, and there was no place for them to hide. You realize that heaven and earth passed away? They're standing in space, nothing under their feet. Now, you know what they're doing? They're standing held there by the power of God that they have spurned and laughed at and made fun of all of their lives. And God demands an answer. If they don't get an answer, when God... God don't give it the right answer. At some point, God's done with it. You know what he does? He just takes away that power to hold them up, and down they go in the lake of fire. And the last thing they'll hear, oh, you ain't going to like this. The last thing they'll hear, oh, Jesus, lover of my soul. The last thing you'll hear, oh, Jesus, care. My the last thing you'll hear as you plummet <coughs> into that lake of fire, the laughter of Almighty God. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. You laugh at him, he's going to laugh at you. You see, he's a righteous God, and he demands some things. So Job chapter 38 here is a pretty clear picture that these questions are all going to be asked by somebody who, who, uh, when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. That's Psalms 33, 6. That's a, by the word of the Lord with the heavens made and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth where he spake it was done and commanded and stood still. That's the creation morning when God is slinging the galaxies and the planets out into the second heaven by his word. The same book that you've got in your hand tonight and the same book that they reject. 
who I shut up the sea with the door when it break forth as it is issued out of the womb, when I made the cloud, the garment thereof, and the thick darkness, a swaddling band. You see that stuff? All that stuff you can find in astronomy and find out there tonight. Well, that that swaddling band, if we were out in the, we were out in the country tonight, it was a clear night, I'd show you that swaddling band going right down through the center of the sky. Oh, yeah. So anyway. That's what you got in Job chapter 38. God chapter 38, God asks man some questions, and he demands some answers. And the answers are only found in an A.B. 1611, and that's what you got.